Hi, everyone. Welcome again to Orangevale Christian Reformed Church. It's so good to uh, be with you again today and to worship with you today. And we want to remember and praise God today for uh, who He is, just how amazing He is, how great He is, and also what He's done in our lives. He's always at work in our lives by His Spirit, changing us and uh, restoring us. He makes us new people, and we praise Him for His grace and for what He does in our lives. And so it's so good to just be together, even though we're in our own homes uh, there's a sense in which we are together worshiping today, and I'm so grateful for that. We're going to begin today with a uh, silent prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be at work today uh, in this time of worship. And so let's do that. Let's spend some time in silent prayer. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this incredible opportunity to be with you today. And we ask that you fill us with wonder and praise at who you are and what you do. And we ask that you open our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The call to worship today comes from Psalm 100. Uh, Psalm 100, this is what it says. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let's enter his courts with praise. Let's sing amid the thronging worshipers. Anna will play for us in the words will be up on the screen so you can sing along amid the thronging worshipers. Since Easter, we have been looking at stories of people converting to Christianity, uh, people encountering Jesus, encountering the good news, and uh, their lives being changed by it. Uh, so far, we've looked at the story of Thomas, and we talked about overcoming doubt, right? Then we looked at Saul, and how Jesus can reach out and take hold of even the most angry and hostile person. Saul was out killing Christians. That's how much he hated Jesus. But there is no one outside of the reach of God's grace. And so we've looked at uh, two stories already, and today we're going to look at Acts 16 and the story of Lydia and how Lydia came to faith. And so I invite you to read along Acts 16, and we're going to read verses 6 to 15. People of God, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of My- Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And so they passed by Mysia and went to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I just want to pause right there for a moment and and, uh, pick up on something there. Uh, Up until this point in Acts, whenever... Uh, Luke is referring to Paul and Silas on their missionary journeys. They always, he always refers to them in the third person. They did this. They did that. But then you get to verse 10, and it says, After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once. There's a shift there. And what scholars think uh, happened is that Paul and Silas met Luke in Troas right here. And so Luke shifts to uh, we, shifts to the first person, because they're now, this is a, a part of the story where Luke is traveling with Paul and Silas. And so he actually travels with them to Philippi. And then after Philippi, when Paul and Silas continue on, uh, uh, it shifts back to they. And so we, th- we know that Luke traveled with Paul and Silas on just this small part of the journey from, uh, from Troas until Philippi. And so, uh, pick it up in verse 11. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the things that is so clear in this passage is that it is, it is the Holy Spirit who brings Lydia to faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, there, there's no other explanation. There's no other way this could have happened except by the Spirit. And so what I want to do is talk about that and, and take a look at that. Look at what the, the Spirit does here. We're going to look at the Spirit's work in three movements. The Spirit sends Paul to Lydia. The Spirit opens Lydia's heart. And the Spirit opens Lydia's home. And so we'll look at each of these in turn. And so first of all, the Spirit sends Paul to Lydia. At this point in Acts, Paul's on his second missionary journey. He's just visited a number of the churches that he planted on his first missionary journey. He's just gone and he's checked in on them. And now he wants to start some new churches. He's going to travel to some other cities to preach the gospel and, and, and start some new churches. But he keeps finding his way blocked. He tries to go to Asia but the Spirit prevents him. Then he goes up to Bithynia, the Spirit prevents him again. And so finally, Paul and Silas end up in Troas. And it's so easy to read over these verses very quickly, as if this all happened in a day or two. I don't think uh, we always appreciate the scale, the distances that Paul was covering here. Uh, here, Here's a map on the screen. Hopefully you can see it okay. And in the middle, in green, is the province of Galatia, which is in modern-day Turkey. And Paul's in Galatia, and he wants to head west, uh, southwest, toward, uh, into Asia, towards cities like Ephesus. Right? But he can't. The Spirit prevents him. And so instead, they go, uh, they go uh, toward uh, Bithynia. But that's not next door. Bithynia is a couple hundred kilometers away. And remember, they're walking. They don't have airplanes. Uh, they don't have cars. They're on foot. And so they walk a couple hundred kilometers and try to get into Bithynia. But the Spirit blocks them again. Uh, we don't know how, uh, but the Spirit blocks them, stops them. So Paul walks a couple hundred more kilometers to Troas. And so for weeks and weeks, Paul and Silas are on the road walking hundreds of kilometers, and they have no idea where they're going. Where is God taking us? 
And it doesn't make any sense. Right? Why wouldn't God want us to preach in Asia and in Bithynia? We're, we're trying to share the good news. This is a good thing. Why is God stopping us? So for weeks, they're perplexed and confused. They're waiting. They're in this state of limbo. What's going on? And this is so important because that's something that happens to us too, right? Sometimes God closes doors. No, you're not going to that university. You're not going to have that job. Uh, you're not going to have another child. You're not going to start this new ministry. God bars the way, and we don't know why. I, I, I have no idea what's next. I'm lost. But look, you're not the only one. Right? This is a common experience. We often travel blind in life. But, that, but just because that's what it feels like to you, you know, I'm wondering, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have some, some plan in mind, some plan, some bigger plan that you just can't see yet. And that's what he had for Paul. God barred the way to Asia and Bithynia because his plan was to bring them to Macedonia, to Lydia. God had Lydia in mind. Right? Just because you can't see the plan right now doesn't mean there isn't one. And so that's the first thing we see here. I mean, it's very clearly the Spirit who is bringing Paul to Lydia. He's setting up this whole encounter. Then second, the Spirit opens Lydia's heart to the gospel. So Paul goes to Philippi, which is the leading city of the province. And that's something Paul usually does. He goes to the major cities, cities that have uh, port, cities that are along a major road like Philippi. Philippi was on uh, the Via Ignatia, the main road running through Macedonia. And Paul does that because if he can start a church in the main city, the gospel will just naturally travel out. It'll find its way out into uh, the towns and villages. It's very strategic on Paul's part. And so Paul goes to Philippi, and he hears about these women who are worshipers of God. And this is a technical term, worshipers of God. And it refers to Gentiles who were drawn to the Israelite God, and they would obey him. They would follow the Jewish law, or at least parts of the Jewish law. And what this tells us is that the Spirit is already at work in Lydia's heart, uh, preparing her heart. You know, usually when someone comes to faith, it doesn't just come out of the blue. Even with Saul, we talked about his conversion the other week, and when you read this story, it sounds like, you know, he hates Christians, he hates Jesus, but all of a sudden, he sees this bright light, he hears Jesus' voice, and instantly his life changes. It sounds like it just happens like that. But there's actually more to the story. In Acts 26, when Paul tells his story there, he says that they were traveling down the road, and he saw this bright light, and he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Uh, a goad is just a sharp stick that farmers and shepherds would use to, to prod their sheep or cattle to get them going when they didn't want to move. They just, they'd give them a good poke. And that's what Jesus has been doing to Saul. Even before the bright light, he's been goading him. There's this passage in Romans 7 where Paul is talking about his life before Jesus, and he refers to the command. It's the last of the Ten Commandments, do not covet. And Paul says, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, this tenth commandment, sin sprang to life, and I died. Now, the first nine commandments are more external commandments. Obey your father and mother, do not murder, do not steal. Right? These are commandments that, that Paul could obey or seem to obey. But then there's that tenth commandment, do not covet. And this is more clearly an inner commandment. This has to do with your heart, what's going on inside, your desires. And when Paul realized that, he died. I, I can keep the other commandments, at least on the surface, but I can't keep this one. I'm filled with every kind of covetous desire. And that was like a goad. Right? It poked him. It ate at him. Saul was there at the stoning of Stephen. Even as Stephen is dying, he's praying for Saul. He's praying for those who are killing him. And then all these other Christians, Saul's Saul killing them, dragging them off to prison, but they don't change their minds. They keep following Jesus. They're so convinced that he's alive. Why? Why? It goads him. Even before Saul saw the light on the road, God was preparing his heart. And that's what God usually does. He, he, he stirs things up in us. He unsettles us. Something's not right. He 
He's preparing us. And we see that in Lydia too. You know, she's drawn. We don't, we don't know exactly why, but she's drawn to the Israelite God. He, he's different than the pagan gods. But still, she must sense something is missing. And that's when she hears the gospel. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul said to Lydia and the other women. It's not recorded. But given that they already worshipped God, they knew something about who God was, we can imagine that he said something like, look, you worship and obey God, and that's great. But there is no amount of obedience that can make you perfectly right with him. And what you need is Jesus. Jesus obeyed perfectly to make you perfect. Jesus died so you can live. He forgave your sin completely. Paul shares this good news, and Lydia, uh, her heart is opened, and she responds. And that word, uh, uh, she responded, it, it, it means attracted. She was attracted to the good news. It, this good news, it was beautiful to her. You know, religion... Uh, religion is outside in. You know, if I obey, God will bless me and help me. He'll give me what I want. But the gospel, it's different. The gospel is inside out. Jesus, he loves me. He died for me. And that's so beautiful and attractive. I love him. I want to serve him. It changes you from the inside out. And the Holy Spirit made Jesus attractive to Lydia. And no, she didn't she did not, uh, no, she did need to hear about Jesus from someone. It's not like the Holy Spirit, out of the blue, uh, zapped her, and she became a Christian. No, Paul had to actually go and preach it. The Spirit worked through a person. But in the end, it was not Paul who opened her heart. It was the Spirit who opened her heart. That's how she believed. And then what happened third is the Spirit opened Lydia's home. She urged Paul and Silas and Timothy to come stay with her. And, you know, you could explain this invitation in purely human terms. You could say, well, you know, Lydia was wealthy. She dealt in purple cloth, which was very expensive. So she owns her own clothing company. She's a CEO. She probably has a huge villa with lots of guest rooms. Of course Lydia is going to invite them over. She has the space for it. But I think there's more to it than that. You know, the reason this verse gets included is because the gospel changes our lives. You know, because Jesus makes room for you, right, you make room for others. When Jesus opens your heart, right, you open your home. You know, one of the people I listened to last week, Jack Rhoda, I just love how he put it. He said, when Jesus comes into your life, there is a decentralizing of the self. You are not the most important person anymore. I mean, Jesus denied himself and died for you. He, he set himself aside to save you. And when that hits, Jesus becomes more important to you than you are. And others become more important to you. And you pay more attention to others and you're ready for others. You become hospitable. You know, one of the signs of the Spirit at work in a church is that you see that church welcoming people, looking for people on the outside, looking for people on the fringes, inviting them in, inviting them into your homes. That's what happens when the Spirit comes into your life. And we see that happening in Lydia. She persuaded them. And look, before Paul encountered Jesus, he wouldn't be caught dead in Lydia's home. She's a woman, a wealthy woman, which would have been kind of dodgy to him. And she's a Gentile. She's unclean. He would avoid Lydia's house like the plague. But now they are brother and sister in Christ. They're family. They're fellow believers. And they go and stay at her home. I mean, there's this this beautiful unity, a bond that they share in Jesus because of the work of the Spirit. And that's what holds this whole story together. We see it just so beautifully on display from start to finish, the Christian life is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit prepares us for Jesus. He brings people into our lives to show Jesus to us. The Spirit opens our hearts and makes Jesus attractive to us. The Spirit changes our lives, opens our homes, makes, a, makes us generous. From start to finish, it is all the work of the Spirit. And our hope and prayer is for the Spirit to continue to do this in us, in our church, in our community, in our own individual lives. 
for the Spirit to change us. And we know He can because He did it in Lydia. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we just marvel at the way you worked in Lydia's life, uh, the way you prepared and orchestrated and arranged everything to bring her to faith, and you opened her heart. Lord, um, just what an encouraging story, and we pray that you encourage each of us today with this story, that, you know, your same Holy Spirit is at work in the world today, changing us, changing others, and we pray for your Spirit to work. Work in us, work in our community in powerful ways, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing in response, How Vast the Benefits Divine. And uh, this is just such a beautiful song because it is so clear uh, in this hymn that we can't come to God on our own. It's only Him. It's His work. We give Him all the glory for what He has done in us by the Holy Spirit. And so again, let's uh, sing three verses, How Vast the Benefits Divine divine. We have the opportunity now to uh, come to our great God in, in prayer. We know that uh, our God works, uh, and Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us, and so we come to God in Jesus' name. As uh, you probably know, I sent out an email last night, so last night was Friday night, about uh, Fred's grandson, Aaron, who had a very serious fall yesterday. Uh, he fractured his skull, uh, had bleeding in his brain, and uh, the doctors were working to uh, save his life. And uh, from Fred said, uh, from what Fred said uh, last night, it, it really didn't look very good. Um, I talked to Fred this morning, and he, he didn't uh, have an update for me yet. And so if I uh, hear anything, uh, I'll send a note out uh, via email. And I invite you to continue to pray for uh, Aaron and Fred and for uh, the whole family. Let's come to God in prayer. Eternal, almighty, gracious Father, we praise you for your mercy, for your love in giving us Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've given us a rescuer. And we praise you that he earned for us victory over death. Thank you that he conquered sin and Satan and death. He did everything that we could never, ever do. We praise you that we have hope for the future. And that we have your spirit at work in our lives already now. The assurance of your spirit reminding us that you're with us. You never leave us. Giving us hope. Uh, we praise you for this gift. 
And uh, we ask that you would um, just grow our faith and grow our joy in you. Give us delight in you and who you are and what you've done. Make us hospitable. Um, make us, um, help, help us to make room for others, to see others, to have eyes to see uh, the needs of those around us. Make us receptive and open to the leading of your spirit. Help us to follow your leading. We pray for faith uh, for us. We pray for faith for our friends, our family who haven't experienced your goodness, Lord. Uh, work in their lives too. And fill us each with the desire to share this good news that we have in you. Give us uh, the zeal of Paul and Silas. We pray for our congregation and for uh, all the other Christians and churches here in our town. And we ask that you would use us all, um, use us all to be a, a shining light. Continue to work in the lives of Mac and Sean and Lydia in Bangladesh and Hector in Central America and Yun uh, in Grand Valley. Lord, uh, may your spirit go uh, ahead of them, um, creating opportunities, uh, preparing the ground. May their work be fruitful. We pray, Lord, for an end to COVID. Uh, we pray that you um, uh, preserve uh, the lives of those who are, are suffering from COVID here and around the world in India. Um, and we, we pray for an end to this disease, Lord, that we can can just worship together again. We can see each other. We can hug each other. We can celebrate with each other. We can uh, cry with each other. Lord, we, we, we long for, um, a, a, for us to be together in person again. Lord, we pray today for a miracle in Aaron's life. We know you are the great healer. You can do all things, and so we lift him up to you, and we ask that you heal him, and we ask that you guide the, the doctors, guide their hands, guide the decisions that they make, Lord, save his life and grant to Fred and the whole family just a comfort and a peace that is only possible in you as they wait and worry anxiously. Lord, um, hold them in your hand. Pray for all those struggling with cancer. Pray for Ken, for Kevin, for Helen, for Carolyn. Pray too for healing for Paul and Doug and Brian. Lord, um, so many of us have struggles in our lives. We have pain in our lives, uh, suffering. We have um, things that we're worried about, people we're worried about. You know all of our needs, and you know them better than we know them. And Lord, we pray that you um, grant to us and, and give to our families and our communities what you know that we need. And we pray that in the rest of this day and the rest of this week, you would fill us with hope. Uh, hope in... Uh, the resurrection of Jesus, that this life is not all there is, but um, we have a glorious life um, waiting for us because of Jesus Christ, because he died for us. Fill us with hope. May we be people of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. In response to God and uh, his work and uh, everything he does, we have the opportunity to give. And today the offering is for Diaconal Ministries Canada, and spe specifically for uh, New Ground. And from what I understand, New Ground is uh, the new name for Operation Mana. And so um, what Diaconal Ministries does is, you know, when, when there's a church that wants to start a new ministry, but they don't have the resources to start that ministry or the, the know-how, uh, what Diaconal Ministries will do is they'll provide funding and they'll provide guidance for churches and communities to start uh, new and creative ministries. And, uh, and, and so that's what um, our, our offering is for today. It's for um, funds to help uh, new and creative ministries to get started here in Canada. And so you can give by uh, dropping off envelopes here at the church. You can also uh, give online, um, either via e-transfer or, or set up a, a direct deposit. And you can talk to Brenda about that. And then uh, today we also have the great opportunity to hear from Mariah, to hear how God is at work uh, in her life and leading in her life. God has something very exciting uh, happening in her life, and we have the opportunity to partner with her in that. So I'm going to invite Mariah to come up and, and share with you. Good morning. 
I am very excited to share what God has been doing in my life and where he is leading me. I have been given this opportunity to attend Life Teams. It is a school of ministry outreach ran by Youth Unlimited Vancouver. Youth Unlimited is a part of a worldwide network with uh, Youth for Christ Ministries. The vision for Life Teams came from the heart of frontline workers who saw the need for quality faith-based training to equip those with a heart for vulnerable young people. However, Life Teams is more than a skill training experience. It is a life transforming experience. I have found that I have a passion for youth through my experience as a counselor with Youth for Christ. I believe that God is calling me to make a difference in the lives of young people and has opened this door to this particular opportunity. Through Life Teams, I will be able to impact teens under the mentorship of veteran missionaries. The program is a mix of classroom learning, practical youth work, and discipleship. I will be learning how to step into the lives of young people while growing my own relationship with Jesus. I am so excited to be one of the 10 young people across Canada who will start this fall, coming fall. I would greatly appreciate your prayers for wisdom and discernment as I prepare for this time of learning and serving. Life Team Student Residence is located just outside of Abbotsford, BC. I will be sharing a room with one to two other students, and it is very much like a small college campus residence with students with study and recreational areas. A prayer cabin is available for students for spiritual retreat times. Most of the time we will do our own cooking with some meals prepared by a cook on in-class days. Staff will be available 24 seven to students and parents. The cost of the eight month certificate program is about $10,000, which includes tuition, lodging and other program expenses. After my time at Life Teams, I will have earned college credits, which I plan on using toward furthering my education. I would like to invite you to partner with me financially on this journey as I step into the lives of young people with God's love. You can make a one-time donation, or you can support me with smaller monthly donations during my time at Life Teams. Your support can be made through www.lifeteams.ca. Since my ministry is a train since Youth Unlimited is a registered charity, you will receive a tax re receipt for any donation toward my ministry and training at Life Teams. I hope to contact you personally within the next two to three weeks to ask for your support. You can also contact me through email or cell, which are both in the bulletin. I will update you during my time at Life Teams through our church bulletin, or you can also check out my Facebook page. September is going to be the start of ye a year of growth and learning that will take me outside of my comfort zone. I am looking forward to learning from the staff and my peers. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to work with Life Teams and looking forward to seeing how God will transform my life. Thanks, Mariah, for sharing that with us. And uh, I'm just so excited to hear what God is uh, doing in your life, and this opportunity just sounds so, uh, so amazing, and, and uh, I thank you for just inviting us to partner with you. I really appreciate you reaching out to all of us and letting us share in some way in uh, your journey, and so, and so thank you so much for sharing with us. As we go, know that uh, God goes with us into this week. He's at work in our lives. He's at work in this world by the Holy Spirit, and uh, he's changing us by his grace. And so as you go, go with that uh, deep, rich assurance. Receive his blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be and abide in you all. And we say together, amen.